In the previous video, I defined a parametric surface. This is a surface in R3 for our purposes that is described by parameters the same way that a parametric curve is described by its parameter t. So now that they are defined, I need to know how calculus works on them. So let sigma be a parametric surface in R3 with parameters u and v. I want the surface to be differentiable. So I say that sigma is in class C1 if all of the partial derivatives exist and are continuous. That means I can make two vectors of partial derivatives, the partials in u and the partials in v. These are local directions on the surface, just like the tangent to the parametric curve was a local direction of the curve. Since these two are local directions, their cross product is perpendicular to both of them, and being perpendicular to both directions, this cross product is locally perpendicular to the surface. That is, this cross product is the normal to the surface. The calculus of a parametric curve was very much determined by its tangent. Everything else, curvature, torsion, all of that, started with the tangent. For a parametric surface, the same is true for the normal. Instead of the tangent, the normal gives all the information about the surface. When I get to integrals over surfaces, the normal will be the tool that I need to understand the interactions of surfaces and fields to get back to that problem of water flowing through a net. I did five examples in the last video. I'm going to go through all five examples and show you how to calculate the normals. So I'll start with a parametric description of the graph of a scalar field. The method for finding the normal is to take the partials in each coordinate, a vector of each, and then the cross product. For the graph of a scalar field, the partials are 1, 0, del f, del u, and 0, 1, del f, del v, since u and v act like x and y in the domain of the scalar field. Well, then I take the cross product of these two and get this result. If you think back to week 4, I calculated the normal for the tangent plane to a two-variable scalar field. Well, this is precisely the same normal. And hopefully that makes sense, because I'm calculating the same idea here, the direction that is locally perpendicular to the surface. I'm just doing it now in a parametric form, but the same vector results. The second general setup I did last video was a surface revolution. The graph of f of x rotated around the x-axis. Here is the parametric setup. The x variable is one parameter to move along the graph, and then the angle is the other parameter to perform the revolution. Again, I take the two partial derivatives, first in x and the second in theta. Then I take the cross product, which produces this normal. This is a little bit different to interpret, but it is the outward direction from this surface of revolution, tilted however it needs it to be tilted, depending on the graph of the function. Here's the calculation for the parametric description of the sphere. R is fixed and the two angles are the parameters. The expressions are the same as spherical coordinates. Again, I take the two partial derivatives in theta and in phi of each component. I get these two vectors from those partial derivatives. Then I take the cross product, which works out to this complicated expression. There are some common factors here. I can actually factor out negative R sine phi. And then notice what is left over. This is precisely the same as the original. Well, why is this so? Well, the normal direction to the sphere is the same as the vector pointing to the point on the sphere. It's outward from the origin. It makes sense that I should get a multiple of this as the normal. The key idea to remember in all of this is that I'm calculating a vector which is per perpendicular to the surface at all points. The results, though complicated, should match that expectation as they do here for the sphere. And here's the calculation for the cylinder. The same setup. Write the parameterization, in this case z and theta. Since those are the parameters, the radius is fixed. Then differentiate in both parameters and take the cross product. The result is a vector which has no z component, but points outward in x and y. And this also makes sense, since the cylinder has vertical walls, so pointing outward should be in a horizontal direction. Finally, here's the calculation for the cone. I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but the setup is the same. Write down the parameterization, 
calculate the partials in each parameter and take the cross product. The calculations here are pretty complex, and the resulting vector is a little difficult to interpret. But I can notice that compared to the cylinder, it has a positive z component. And this reflects the fact that the outward direction from the comb should point upwards and not just outwards, because the cone is slanted inwards.